talking. So we couldn't have planned it better to have today's session on the first Sunday of Advent uh, because um, just if you just we're going to offer a class on the collects of Advent this coming Wednesday and the collect for today pairs beautifully with this um, visit from the first spirit uh, in terms of light and darkness. So um, that's another theme in this um, stave two, chapter two that we might explore at some point. The extinguisher the cap has been woven through 1800 years by yeah. human beings. I didn't get that until today. I mean, I, it's just amazing how much I've missed in 60 years. <laughs> Thank God for <laughs> 60 more, I hope. <laughs> maybe maybe heaven and a Christmas carol will be all I need. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Notice, I noticed this morning at, uh, at Bishop Welby's sermon, he started the whole thing off saying, because it's Advent, we need to look at our past and we need to look at our future. And it was like, I, I, obviously the readings are going to be from Christmas Carol, so. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have you four in a square, but I don't have you up here at the top. We haven't gone to the to the other view yet. You'll go to that view whenever we share a screen. Okay, you said you were going to start sharing it, so I didn't know if you had. I haven't yet, no. Okay. Uh, I don't have, I, I thought maybe, Father Casey, I know when we get started here in a few minutes, you're going to recap some of the themes of Advent for us, which is great. We have picked up, oh, there we go. We oh, have yeah, up, and you were uh, wait up there for a moment. <laughs> now, let me see if I can get us all up there. Too. This will no, be I helpful. Them, right in the middle. Well, oh, that's all right. Oh, there they are. You're up there. Okay, cool. There you go. Um, the one thing I was hoping to do this week was to squeeze in a clip from uh, the Disney animated version uh, because I think I, I went through and looked at, um, uh, oh, I don't know, half dozen different cinematic depictions of the first spirit. And um, they're all pretty pathetic, you know, um, Hollywood efforts because special effects didn't exist sufficient to sort of capture the D Dickensian description of the spirit until you get sort of the computer CGI graphics that, and um, I love the effort that went into that. Um, uh, it's, um, oh, what's his name? Robert Zemeckis. Um, who created that. And um, I think he does a, about as good a job as you can do capturing what I think Dickens is trying to describe. So I was going to pop that up just for a minute or two, just so oh, people can um, see uh, one expression of the spirit. W would that come at, right at the beginning? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it up at the beginning uh, after, before after we can dive in. After you about Advent, then boom. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Oh, okay. God. We I'll watched, just sit back and listen. <laughs> we watched a version this week. It was done in 1951. Remember who that was in that? Alistair Sims played Scrooge. Alistair Sims. Alistair Sim, which is one of my favorite versions. Played, played Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, and it was very, there were a few spots, having recently read it and in the process of rereading it yet again, there are a few spots where we thought, that's off script. But it was otherwise very faithful. Um, and George, I watched the scene with the George C. the George C. Scott nineteen eighties version uh, to see what they did with the uh, first ghost, and um, it's like a lady in a red yeah. gown mm -hmm. with white hair. I mean, it doesn't even yeah. try. Yeah, it does. It's not even. She's she has no. There's no light. There's no. There's not none of the sort of what I think to be core essence of what this spirit is about it's just like ditched and um and i think it has a lot to do with uh the just the lack of any way that they could capture it um uh and i think it was made for tv and i just think they had not a lot of budget and <laughs> limited amount of imagination Kara floyd shares that she always watched an american christmas carol as a kid with henry winkler and so now I got to go take a look at that. <laughs> That's awfully tempting. I just learned this morning what jump the sharp means. Because <laughs> yes. a CNN thing said that the Trump administration was trying to jump the shark. And so that was Henry Winkler <laughs> on, on water skis. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, well, maybe then, Father Casey, you, you, 
um, do the image and, and, and talk about what you see it representing and why it was important to not just have a woman in a red, red robe. Yeah, yeah. The point, I mean, the, the, uh, and I think this is kind of what we're, we're trying to get at in, in this particular class is that it is, it is, there is more to this than just that he goes to the past you know, zips around the present and, and, to, and gets a glimpse of the future. It is also in the how. There's a lot of the, the how is also really important to the, to the points that are being made within the story. And so it is not, um, you know, coincidental or, or, or just um, sort of, uh, you know, um, it's not incidental that, that the ghost of Christmas past has the description that it has. Exactly. Um, so. Uh, and I think that he's, and we'll get into this, you know, I, I, I think that there's a ton about the importance of memory mm -hmm. and um, the sacredness of memory and, the, and, um, and the way that we try to stifle memory uh, and manipulate memory, but um, that there is, you know, I think Dickens is playing with, with that, with, with memory, so. But I'm going to add maybe at the end of our session, this is about Christmas past, not always about Scrooge's Christmas yeah. past, because in the last one, when he visits Belle and her husband, he isn't there. He's in mm. the, so, I mean, it's time. It's about time as yeah. well as Scrooge's past and yeah. memories. Yeah, absolutely. It's combined there some way. I, I just learn every day. <laughs> <laughs> We've got just a few more minutes, but I'm, I'm thrilled at the uh, uh, registration for this class, which has just been marvelous. And we, um, we have you know, about 100 people who are tuning in, and we're so grateful for all of you joining us today. Thank you for coming back this week, those of you who were there with us two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, we'll do a brief recap to start the class here in just a couple minutes of uh, the themes of Advent and how we're going to be exploring some of those themes in A Christmas Carol. If you weren't with us, uh, don't worry. I'm going to do that recap. If you were with us, I don't know, maybe you would benefit from, um, from a little refresher. And so we'll go back into that before we jump into Stave 2, um, Chapter 2, uh, titled Stave 2. And um, so you have about three minutes. If you didn't do your reading, then, um, you know, you can just read very quickly and, uh, and you'll be ready. So that's good. I think there are on online Spark and Cliff Notes as well. If you want to yes, yeah. get over that, <laughs> get the shark that way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly, and you will because you'll miss so much. But uh, <laughs> you'll at least know what's happening in the. And in the apparently, yeah, the phrase kind of now good. means something not very good because the series is declining. <laughs> Cliff Notes are that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this exercise has really helped me understand something I don't think I did understand as a teenager that there's, as, as you were saying, Father Casey, there's just so much more to it than the basic plot of what's happening. Uh, and perhaps one of the things that has made it so intriguing for me this time through is that I'm familiar with the shape of the story from so many movies and from a couple of read throughs in my past. And so um, now I'm able to drop deeper and pay attention to the little details that are just so remarkable. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the Bible and that is the book is always better. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> nice plug. Nice <laughs> plug, Roy. Excellent work. Don't worry, Deuteronomy is going to come up later, but anyway. That's <laughs> oh, <right>. good. <laughs> oh, yes, of uh, course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. And oh. under a far underexplored piece of scholarship is the intersection of a Christmas Carol with Deuteronomy. I just really think there's opportunity there for a bestseller. Just buckle your seatbelt. So <laughs> well, you, you've already cited Ezekiel, which <laughs> back to maybe at the beginning of stage five, when you That's changed right. the heart of stone. That's right. The heart of flesh. So that was very cool. And I looked it up and learned more. Have to write another chapter now. <laughs> I, uh, I want you to know, Dr. Heller, your fan club is, is hot in the chat session. They're ready for Deuteronomy. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. oh, Lord. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> I'll, t I'll try to do my best. Yeah. See if I, see if I remember it.
Well, I think it's time. So why don't we go ahead and begin, everyone. Welcome back to Advent with Ebenezer, an exploration of the uh, themes of Advent as uh, portrayed unintentionally, probably mostly, uh, in Charles Dickens's classic novella, A Christmas Carol. This is our second session. Uh, and we welcome back uh, uh, Dr. Robert Patton, uh, who is our, uh, our Dickens scholar, spent a lifetime um, uh, exploring and studying the work of Charles Dickens, and in particular, among all of his works, knows this work quite well, and already last week brought to us so much richness uh, lurking there in this text, and, uh, and we will continue to learn from him this week and in the coming three weeks after. So, Bob, welcome back today. And uh, we welcome back, of course, Dr. Roy Heller, our, uh, our Old Testament scholar here at Transfiguration, who has blessed so many of us uh, with a patient exploration of the uh, Hebrew Bible and is a devotee of this particular work of Dickens and reads it by tradition, by personal custom, every Advent, every December. And uh, so is, uh, is, a, is a lover of this story and uh, enriches us with all of his uh, insights into the story. And Mother Rebecca Tankersley and I uh, just get to hang out with the two of these greats and uh, join in the conversation as well and try to try to lend whatever we can um, as this story comes alive to us in new ways with, with fresh readings. So we're glad to have you all back. <clears throat> um, as we begin, I just want to uh, recap last, week, last week's exploration of, um, of the three um, of the, excuse me, of the, of the core themes of Advent that, that are kind of woven in this story. Again, unintentionally, I don't think anyone would claim that Dickens was setting out to write an Advent story, um, but, uh, but they are there nevertheless. And so we're going to be looking at these, looking for these themes and the ways that they're present in the story. Advent means coming. It's uh, from a Latin word meaning coming and uh, the coming is in two parts of Advent, the coming of Christmas, which we celebrate uh, when we um, honor the nativity of Christ, Christ's first coming. We uh, honor the way that Christ is now uh, coming among us uh, in the, uh, the, the body of the church and in the presence of the sacrament. Uh, but most especially, Advent draws our attention to the coming of Christ um, at the end. Uh, Christ's eventual return and the coming back into the world in the fullness of the kingdom. So the coming that we explore in Advent has a multifaceted, multi-temporal nature, past, present, and future. All right. Advent is also a time in which we explore the themes of judgment and repentance, which I know for most of us, we associate most specifically with the season of Lent, and yet Advent is also a season in which judgment and repentance are quite present. And we get those most decidedly through John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptizer, the prophet, the great prophet who foretold of the Savior's arrival and prepared the way for him and who preached uh, uh, repentance and an amendment of life uh, to get ready for the Savior. So Advent is a season in which we are invited by John the Baptist and um, invited by the church into a time of repentance, of, of um, changing direction, of changing course in our life, because we know that when Christ comes at the end, he comes as, as redeemer and judge, that he will stand upon um, the throne and, um, as we heard in last Sunday's readings, um, uh, separate the sheep and the goats. And uh, there will be a great laying bare of all things, of all of creation, and everything will be known for what it truly is, and every um, action and every um, intention will be fully revealed. So a season of judgment and repentance. Oh, let me, there we go. It's a season of anticipation, preparation, and readiness. You're going to get this um, less this year in year B because Mark doesn't do a lot of this, you get this more in other years with some of Jesus's great parables and what she talks about um, preparing for uh, the bridegroom's arrival, trimming your wicks, refilling your, the, your lamps with oil, being ready because you know not when the bridegroom, the son of man will return. He comes like a thief in the night, Jesus says. And so you must be constantly vigilant. You must be ready in your life. You, you must not go to sleep, Jesus says again and again, keep awake. And this is obviously more than um, literal. It is 
um, metaphorical. It is um, the way that we stay awake in our lives with our attention to righteousness, to holy living, and uh, the way that we must be ready and the way that we conduct our lives, um, uh, knowing that um, his coming again ha could happen at any time. All right, so Advent is a season of anticipation, preparation, and readiness. And lastly, it's a season in which there's a, a, a sharp um, awareness of the contrast between darkness and light. Um, it's uh, a theme that is present in the collect for the first Sunday of Advent, which we'll pray just in a second. Um, but even as, in, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, darkness is growing as the days are growing longer, um, we are aware and put in mind of the light that comes into the world in the person of Christ, which no darkness could ever extinguish or put out. And so there's this reflection on light shining in the darkness, darkness growing, but not able to ever extinguish the light and the way that light overcomes all darkness. So we are called to be children of light, um, uh, the colics and, and um, uh, Paul's writing um, in some of his letters that we hear in Advent um, remind us. So those are just some of the core themes. Advent as a season in which we reflect on the coming of Christ, past, present, and future. Advent as a season in which our minds are set on the judgment of Christ at his return and our need for repentance. Advent as a season in which we anticipate, prepare for, and ready ourselves for his coming again, make our lives about being um, uh, ready and prepared and a season in which uh, we reflect on the, um, on the nature of God's light, which shines in the darkness. So let us pray um, the first Sunday, the colic for the first Sunday of Advent, which we heard if you tuned in to church this morning at nine, uh, or uh, if you're coming to join us in the comfortable, very comfortable outdoor service. Uh, Rebecca, don't shake your head. People might still come. So the very comfortable outdoor service that will occur at 1130. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So, friends, um, I, uh, as we begin today, and Bob is going to kick us off uh, with some reflections on some of the themes, but I want to play just a little clip uh, to help us imagine. We're in stave two this week, the second chapter of the novella, um, and uh, and this is, of course, when the ghost of Christmas past comes to visit Scrooge and lead him through various facets of his own story and other people's stories. Um, but this is a hard, um, a hard ghost to imagine or spirit to imagine. And so I want to um, uh, just show you, where is it? There we are. One of the cinematic depictions, just a minute or two of it, the Disney uh, version that came out just a, a handful of years ago, the animated version starring Jim Carrey, but it was an animated uh, form. And um, I, I find it to be really quite wonderful in its effort to capture what this spirit would have been like. Oh, hold on. <laughs> you can't see anything, can you? I wonder if Zoom prevents you from being able to see it. <laughs> well, this is no good. Hold on. I'm going to try one more time and then I'm going to give up because it's not necessarily worth it. You can see the Disney Plus now. Yeah, I, I just wonder if they have the technology to prevent you from watching it on Zoom. Well, we can see your miniature version as you slide. Yeah, it's so weird. I 
I, I don't know. So um, somehow it knows that I'm trying to share it. And so I'm going to stop. Oh, oh, it did it. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to try once more. Oh, you silly thing. It does know, doesn't it? Okay, never mind. Well, um, do you I have think... a copy of the book there? Could you read it to us? Or bits of it to say why that seemed important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So hold on, let me get it. Nope, that's the one. I know he has a book. Yeah, I know he has a Bible in that office, but I didn't know he had the carol there. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it just, it gets it um, from me. It, and and you know I know we're going to explore other things about the um, the story, many things, but the um, the appearance of the first spirit is not just accidental. Uh, that's the word I was looking for earlier. It is, um, in fact, one of the, my favorite scenes in the entire novella, and um, the the appearance of the of the first spirit. So this is important. It was, a, it was a strange figure, like a child yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet most delicately formed were like those upper members bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strange thing about it was that from the crown of its head, there sprung a bright clear jet of light by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which it now held under its arm. It's like a living candle. This spirit is like a living candle, which is both um, uh, youthful and ancient all at the same time. And I just find that to be marvelously important because the spirit, of course, is revealing memories, is revealing this past, is sort of like a, a, an analogy, a living embodiment of memory itself, which is both youthful and old, um, uh, uh, distant and also fresh. Um, and, and we can get into it later, Bob, after, after we hear um, some of the themes that you've got. I just find that that's just really so special and important. Friends, if you want to go watch that Disney version and you'll see what I mean if you have Disney Plus um, and you, you'll see what I mean. Well, one of the things that Fred, when he comes in, Scrooge's nephew, uh, early on in the first stave says that we're all fellow uh, travelers on the road to death. Uh, and we learn from Marley that he has been traveling these seven years without any surcease and the last little uh, woodcut at the end of stave one is of all these traveling people uh, wandering around unable to do in death what they should have done in life which was to extend their lives outward into other people and other situations and knit the world together and in the very stave, especially in the, uh, the, the stave three in the Ghost of Christmas Present, uh, Scrooge and the ghost travel all around England uh, uh, to see how other people have Christmas. So traveling itself is important, but traveling each one of us must do from life to death. And that seems to be a journey that needs certain kinds of guidance and help. Uh, and in this particular chapter, uh, at, the, at the very beginning, when the first, the first thing that Scrooge sees when uh, he and the uh, spirit go back in time to where he uh, grew up and, and went to school, is all these boys and girls, they're, they're riding donkeys and they're going back into town. They're going home for Christmas. And Scrooge isn't going in that direction. He's still, the, the, the boy Scrooge is still 
in the school, the, the very old decaying school. It's a, a, an older, you know, edifice as, as it were. Uh, and so the idea, first of all, of traveling and secondly, of what rescues Scrooge, which is first of all, things like books, uh, which was true of Dickens as well. And most of the annotations on this part uh, say these were books that were favorite books of Dickens is their story of the uh, Arabian Nights, uh, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, uh, Robinson Crusoe, who makes his own home on a desert island and uh, Scrooge sees the parrot that greets him and sees uh, his man Friday trying to escape from the other cannibals who want to kill him. Uh, and he then reads about Valentine and Orson who are twin boys, uh, medieval legend that was very popular as a children's uh, story in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, Valentine grows up in a courtly home and learns how to fence and do all the good things. And uh, Orson, uh, whose name suggests Ursus Bear, is raised by bears uh, and has no manners, <laughs> you know, and, and just isn't a cool guy at all. And so is home something like a bear's clay cave or is it, the, you know, a home for, anyway, and Scrooge is, is, is reading about these stories and imagining home. And then Fan comes in and says, father is ever so much nicer now. And evidently father and Scrooge's son have been at rivals and there's a missing mother there. So we don't quite know how that conflict occurred. We don't quite know how it was resolved. But Fan says, you're coming home, home, home. And it's repeated three times. And then mm -hmm. that's where they go. That's where the ghost visits all the rest of this episode until finally he visits a home that he's never been in. So uh, Roy, I know, wants to say more about this because he and I just suddenly discovered that we were on the same path this morning about an hour ago. So Roy, add a- No, it's just, again, you're just right. I mean, it's when when a little fan comes in it's it, in case you in case uh, in case someone's um, just skimming this right and they don't want to see the theme um, Dickens will take a stick and beat you over the head with it <laughs> so, um, so I've come to bring you home dear brother uh, said the child clapping her tiny hands and bending down to lap to bring you home 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 little fan returned the boy yes said the child um, brimful of glee home for good home forever and ever father is so much more kinder now than he used to be that home's like a heaven again if you if you don't see the theme home then um you're not reading um so um so yeah but again it's so it's so beautiful right because he 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 doesn't have a home he's been rejected in the first scene in the second scene little fan comes in and says that he can come home in the third scene with Fezziwig, in a sense, he does have a home and he does have a place and, and, and he sleeps there um, and it's a joyful, joyful thing. And then in the next scene, he actually rejects home, right? Because of, uh, with his fiance, he actually rejects it. And then finally in the fifth scene, again, it's almost like a Shakespearean play, right? In the fifth scene, um, there he is again and he's alone. Uh, just like he is in the first scene. In the first scene, he's alone because he's being rejected. But in that final scene, when he's in that counting house and Marley is, he's not even with Marley, right? And Marley is dying. Um, in that final scene, um, he's alone, not because he's been rejected, but because he's rejected everyone else. And so it, it's just a beautiful, um, a beautiful interweaving of that theme of home, I think. So. It's interesting, the, the idea of traveling and home. The other thing that, that weaves in, in, at least in this stave, is heaven. So mm. when, when he's waiting the spirit, it says he tries to go back to sleep and it says he could no more go to sleep than he could go to heaven, right? <laughs> which is such a wonderful word play because of course, none of us can actually just choose to go to heaven and go. Scrooge in particular really <laughs> can't go to heaven. And then here comes Fan to take him home saying home is like heaven. Mm -hmm. And it, there's something about Scrooge needing to go home and to experience home so that he can be redeemed and potentially maybe will at one point enjoy eternal life. That's right. 
Beautiful. Yeah. There's a way in which being alone is like the um, the greatest condemnation that Dickens has. Uh, so, um, you know, at, at the end, uh, when we get to the ghost of um, Christmas yet to come, um, and and his body is discovered alone. Mm. It's it's like the worst thing that could happen to you is that you would have no one there to mourn for you, no one to love you, um, to have no one in your life, no community, no home. Here, are homes like heaven, and Scrooge has essentially created a life in which he has no home. Um, the, the, he has a building in which he sleeps, but it's not home. Uh, and um, and when he. Uh, um, uh, that w- when the man, when the husband of Bell in this stave is, is saying, oh, I ran into Scrooge um, and, and they're like kind of having a bit of a laugh. And also it's kind of, it's, it's sad in the same moment. Um, he comments that he is quite alone in the world, I do believe. Right. Like the saddest thing to say about a person is that they're alone. That's right. But, and, 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 which parallels, right, his first appearance in the school where yeah. there was a solitary boy, exactly. right? And so it's it's beautiful bookends. But Fan promises home forever and ever. Mm-hmm. And of course, um, so we have this kind of dual tension that even in life, it may not be possible for us uh, to to go home again, as Tom Wolf <laughs> uh, uh, and And we all have to leave home and go out into the world. And Scrooge does that. There's a... There's a really subtle way in which we see an adolescent progressing from school to first job and then out into the world uh, in the counting house. And uh, he, he really has to leave home. And yet uh, it's never going to actually work for him. It's, it's just what we saw it in the first uh, stave when he goes home for Christmas dinner and he has a little bit to eat on the outside and then brings rule back to the, that lonely, cold house, sitting room, reception room. Uh, so home is, is all what we all seek and what we can never have forever, either in this life or maybe in, we, we can have it in the next. So that's another way of sort of preparation for the end. And I hadn't thought of that until this moment. Thanks for your introduction today, Father Casey. Yeah. Right. This is a jointly written book, and it's going to be a thousand pages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something that struck me from, again, I don't want to go back last week, but right, things sort of ruminate and ferment, right? But something that struck me is, right, right the famous line from Scrooge, right? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? And yet the narrator describes um, Scrooge's own working place. He talks about how uh, Bob Cratchit is in a little cell, you know? And so in fact, Scrooge himself is in a workhouse. In fact, Scrooge himself is in a prison and that prison is not just where he works. In fact, it's his life and he's in solitary confinement, right? But not not through, and and, and he's also in chains, right? We know this from Marley, he can't see them. Yeah. But in fact, he's in longer chains than Marley's in. And so he's in prison, he's in chains, he's in solitary confinement. Yeah. Um, but through his own will, he's, all, he's done this. And so that's what's so sad. So, yeah. The, 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 reading, again, I've read this, geez, who knows, 15, 20 times, right, um, with some attention. And it's really funny, this time of reading it through, I've really, I've really sort of turned a corner with Scrooge. And that is, he's no longer someone that is despicable. He's someone that's pitiable. Yeah. Um, and through his own, through his own decisions. So anyway. Uh, well, that, that's wonderful because the other part of, of this particular visit is something that I think many of us uh, in the world could uh, identify with now which is that uh, if we feel that we've been traumatized uh, by, by our lives in various ways, there are various kinds of therapies that ask us to go back into the past and think through them again, have a different response, a different way of understanding. Um, and gosh, things like um, AA, uh, which one of the tasks is to go back and, uh, and, and confront all the people you may have offended in your life 
uh, and ask for forgiveness. Uh, and so that sort of system of going back, understanding what one's own uh, capability or culpability is for the events of that one's life and reassessing what could have been done, but you can't change the path. And Scrooge can't change anything. I would like to go back. You begin seeing him That's in true. his adult life revisiting these sites and wanting to go back to the first day and rewrite it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. one of the things about this gift of time is that it's not like Doctor Who's TARDIS. You can't go and make an intervention. And if you can have teenagers who were reluctant to read, just suggest that this is a version of Doctor Who and maybe they'll come on board, I don't know. Uh, but you can't change this past. Now, there was somebody that offered us an opportunity to change it forever. Mm -hmm. But that isn't strongly focused here. It's more the regret and, and, and we begin to feel Scrooge himself softening. The word is often used. He's softened by this. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, it's as if he, he got, well, we know he was hard and cold at the beginning and he's warming up and melting. That's uh, right. I don't like the wicked witch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all my beautiful wickedness, you know, going down. Yeah. But anyway. There are just so many ways. Dickens was writing at a furious pace for two or three weeks. This was it. And somehow, I think all of us have had a moment in life where just everything converges. And it works in so many different ways that we couldn't have possibly plotted. And I think often it's reading one of the lessons for the for Sundays that, ah, that just sort of seizes every moment of my life and puts it in perspective. And that's what Scrooge seems to be getting in this past journey. So he goes through school, through, through imagination, which saves him from loneliness. They come to him as real people uh, for, for him, as, as many of us. I was a lonely kid reading books, and that was my company. And maybe for kids, for television, it's Dr., you know, it's uh, Mr. Rogers or whatever. And then to work, and what Roy said is right, uh, they sleep. Apprentices slept in the factory or the workplace for the seven years of their apprenticeship. So that, that was home to them and it transforms. Now it transforms in the very way that, uh, well, in a different way from what's gonna be transforming Scrooge's own sitting room uh, in the next uh, stage. So, uh, and then that last home isn't his and it's filled with children and it's filled with even a young child who looks like his former fiance, Belle. But when he separated from her was at the point where she was most lonely because her parents had died and she's in mourning. And she's also poor, there are no resources. So her separation she reads as uh, because Scrooge wouldn't marry a poor woman who has no future in the economy of making a home. That's beautiful. The, 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 the whole notion for me, right? I mean, repentance is a, t is a tricky thing, right? I mean, K Father Casey mentioned repentance as an advent and right? repentance is a, is a, it's a, it's a tricky thing because it's, it's a recognition that things have been done that you cannot change. Mm -hmm. And yet there is a desire to change, right? And, and at the, and um, I'm just here near the end of the first scene with the lonely boy, right? He's just talked about Alibaba and Robin Crusoe, right? And the parrot and, and Friday, right? Mm -hmm. And then it says, I wish, Oh, then he, I'm sorry, then, uh, let's start here. Uh, then with a rapidity of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said in pity for his former self, poor boy. And, and that for me at least that's really important, right? Because the boy is poor, um, but he's poor in all sorts of ways, poor boy. And Scrooge cried again. I wish Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him after drying his eyes with his cuff, but it's too late now. What's the matter, asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. 
there was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have given, I, I should like to have given him something. That's all. So it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing because, right, because there's no way he can go back and get the boy again. And yet there's this, right, it's too late now, but is it, right? Is it too late? Well, it's too late there, but so for me at least, it's just, it's that first, it's, and particularly for me at least, a Christmas carol, right? And it's the place where the actual phrase is used in the text. It's that first sort of chink in the armor, that first drop, drop of that frozen heart um, that sort of is right there with that little boy that was at the keyhole the night before. Um, and so, so for me at least, that, that scene is, is indicative of repentance. Because it's a it's it's a knowledge that you can't change, and yet you have to change, or you must change. So. I uh, I absolutely screen. share that. Um, uh, a couple years ago, um, I stayed at the seminary St. John the Evangelist, and one of the brothers delivered a homily and said something I've never forgotten. He said, "If we if we knew the full truth of one another's stories, we would genuflect instead of judge." Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> there's there's something about we are getting a little glimpse into his story and it's um it's softening it's softening our attitudes towards scrooge but what i find really remarkable is that the ghost of christmas past takes him you know if the whole idea if the whole trajectory of this experience is to is to help him transform then one possible course of um of exploration will be to take him to all the things where he screwed up and to sort of point them out and to show how bad and wrong he was right. but where the spirit takes him first is to take him to a moment of supreme humanity and vulnerability when he where he is reminded that he was once a child and full of um uh you know full, um uh, it's, it's not a bad moment it's a it's a sad moment mm -hmm. that's right and he says it's two or three times, poor boy. Yeah. Um, and for me, at least that's because, right, because Scrooge measures everything by money, right? By what the value is. Yeah. And that's part of what his danger is. It's not that he's, he's for me, at least, he's not greedy as that he wants lots of stuff. He, in fact, he doesn't have much stuff, yeah. right? It's, he's kind of actually sort of destitute in a, in, a, in a way, but he has lots of money, but he measures everything by what, what it costs, I mean, monetarily, yeah. and, and and so and so seeing that child in that room, who, who has no friends except the friends in the page, um, he is poor. But but again, it's really neat because Scrooge doesn't mean monetarily; he means. Mother in, in Rebecca life. was uh, doing some blue lining there for me at least, mm. and she kept coming on the word power. Hmm. Uh, and power. I, I wondered I if you to... wanted to talk about that. He doesn't have power. Yeah. Well, I was trying to find this passage here, which is yeah. a, a parallel to the one, Dr. Heller, that you were talking about, where he has another of these moments that show us repentance, right? Uh, they're talking about how expensive Fezziwig's parties were, right? They're so expensive, points out the spirit. And Scrooge says, no, no, it's it's... It's, it's nothing, it's not the expense of it. And I love this. It isn't that spirit. He has the power, Fezziwig has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks in things so slight and insignificant, it is impossible to add and count them up, what then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. And then you, it's like you can see the light bulb go on oh, over Scrooge's head and he <laughs> realizes that he is Fezziwig or he could be and that he has that power and he has not, excuse me, he's not been using it. Right. He's not been using it and he thinks immediately of I, I just would like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. Yeah. Now he realizes, now he realizes I yeah. can't go back and undo, but right now that's I right. could say something to my clerk. That's right. And I that's, could be that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. It, it, at the end of the first, and again, not wanting to go back, but it's so beautifully tied together, right? At the end of the first day, we're seeing all of the spirits, right? 
Um, and actually, I use this in my Amos lecture when I lecture on Amos. Um, the end of the first stave, um, we sing all of them. Um, and he says, the narrator tells us, the misery with all of these spirits flying around, the misery with all of them was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Yes. You know, and there it is, there's the power to, to actually do something for other people. Because um, one of the things, yeah, as I say in my lecture, you know, the funny thing about a corpse, it can't really help many people, you know, it can't really do much at all. Um, and so, yeah, so there's the power again. And, and this relates and then, to, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, look at how this concludes. Scrooge has had the realization, the light bulb comes on and his former self turns down the lamps in mm. the Fezziwig office. If, if folks were to go back and reread this, we haven't touched on it a whole lot, yeah, but, but, yeah. but this whole chapter opens with it being so dark that Scrooge cannot distinguish between the translucent glass and the solid wall. That's how dark it is. And then throughout the stave, there's this turning on and turning off of light um, that is really, really important. And time, because he says, I don't know whether it's midnight, you know, on the next day and I slept 24 hours or whether, you know, it's the middle of the day and the sun's gone and it's it's just it's all so scary but what the other thing i wanted to just bring up with this power and and what the ghost what what the fezziwig did is that's the different computation it's not like scrooge thinking there's a pie and there's only so much of it and you've got to get it uh because this didn't cost anything to give a little happiness to people and the ghost of christmas present the same thing he doesn't like say Nicholas did allegedly, you know, put things in the stocking so three girls could have uh, a dowry and get married. Uh, he just—it's something he sprinkles, and it's in in the in the last uh, times he's with Fred. Scrooge is with Fred. It's the happiness that communicates. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that's the gift, and it is, I think, for us too. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, we kind of whoop and holler because Scrooge does seem to, well, I'm not going to give away that, that, that <laughs> ending, but seem to. And in fact, a lot of people didn't believe that he did recover. So we'll talk about that later. But anyway, happiness, these kinds of social interactions, which God knows we're all feeling the lack of right now, are just exactly what can make life tolerable. What makes it so good in Fezziwigs is the dancing. Mm -hmm. And notice that when Fezziwig dances, his legs are like candlesticks. They're like light radiating from them. Yes. That's beautiful. That's fascinating. There, there's this, again, this comes back to the, the, go, the, the spirit is not taking him to places for which he should repent, right. like all the things he did wrong. Okay. He's giving him glimpses of a different side of humanity and, the, and, and life than he has allowed himself to ponder. So he takes him first to show him how vulnerable he was, and then he takes him to a moment of, of true transcendent joy, this moment of perhaps his, his greatest enjoyment ever in his entire life and, and reminds him of what that looks like and what it feels like because he hasn't felt it in so long. He's almost forgotten what it looks like. And then, and then they go ahead a little further and he shows him this glimpse and, and essentially ostensibly, right? The scene with Belle and the husband is about that moment of saying, oh, I saw Scrooge and he was alone. You know, what a, what a, what a sad duck that guy is, except Dickens builds the scene by showing this this whole family home, as we were talking about earlier, this home scene that is just soaked in joy, uh, the joy of of an abundance of life. Um, all these forty children, and it's it's like it's like the spirit is trying to guide him, to shepherd him along to repentance, but not through um, finger wagging, but through joy like showing him that's how the, the transformational power of joy. That's right. And, that's and how the, the, you know, people used to do, mo most people until the beginning of the industrial age worked at home and home and work were not separate entities. They're not separate cultures. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and now what we see is that that old apprentice system still in existence for Fezziwig. Mm -hmm. uh, this 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 story is not necessarily right at 1843, uh, but it, but it it still has lingering characteristics of an earlier co combinational sort of uh, life where you don't have to, well, like we're beginning to know now that the work and home are the same place. And then you see that evacuated as Scrooge, first of all, Bell's parents have died. Bell doesn't have any money. And the, the idol of gold has completely reoriented what, where Dickens thinks, uh, where Scrooge thinks home is and what he's heading for, where his journey is going toward. And at the end of that chapter, he has completely divorced himself from family, from activity, from love, from community. Uh, the single candle burning, still the light can't be extinguished entirely. And you can see through the picture uh, and learn things, but it's, it's an evacuation for him from a moment when he really did have it all. I mean, he proposed to Bell in the same period of time when he was just beginning in life. And now he doesn't even have a home because his home is Marley's home. Mm -hmm. He lives oh, in the dead man's home. Uh, so uh, Kara Floyd has asked if we can go back to the image of the first spirit. Mm -hmm. And I want to um, share my screen because I think um, yeah. this is what you were trying to show. Yeah. Uh, Father Casey. So here's this. I'll let you talk about it. Well, I, you know, it's it, if you if you watch cinematic depictions of this, they have to cast or they tend to cast um, back. I mean, we're talking about movies filmed in the 40s, 50s, you know, 60s, etc. Even through the 80s, you're you're casting people in this character to portray the the role. Um, and uh, and usually they have white hair or a white countenance, but it, they are they are d distinctly uh, very human. And there there is a way in which Dickens is um, writing about a sort of genderless candle. It's like a a, um, a personification of a candle. Candle being a a great metaphor or or an image for memory, um, an analogy for memory. So it's almost like like the incarnation of memory is shepherding him around. And there's a moment where the face sort of uh, um, toggles through and it's, and it's his face and it's lots of faces. So the face is both very youthful, extremely youthful, fresh, um, a bloom, a fresh bloom of youth. And also there's this extreme age that is about this, th this figure as well. So you have light emanating out of the top and you have this youthfulness blended with with um, uh, with age, um, and it is representative of him. It is really his likeness, but it is almost sort of a perfection of that. Um, it, you know, Dickens is doing a lot of hard work to try to sort of capture this. It's not just like a ghost shows up like Marley, like another just you know um, ethereal figure apparition. This is something different. Right. It's stri it strikes me as very. I mean the when I read that, it strikes me as very pre-Freudian type of dealing with memory yeah. and, and reflection, you know, that, that what, and again, Bob, Bob said it himself, right, in AA, you go back and you think about the various people, yes, that you've heard, but various, uh, your life, and it seems to me, right, with, with that, with that um, opening up the curtains, and there Scrooge is confronted and he's confronted by all of these faces, um, one after the other, right there before him. I mean, it, for me, that's that's what's, and he can't ignore it, right? He says he hasn't forgotten anything, right? When when he says that he hasn't repressed any memories, and yet, as soon as it starts, it's like I re I know this place. Yeah. I, I I he names all of the boys as they trot by. It's just so beautiful for me. At least it's almost tear jerking. It's it's just so beautiful how he has forgotten so much, and that's his problem. Um, it, and, at okay. the very end, at the very end of the chapter, the, one of the very last things that happens is he has just been shown all of this stuff. He's had all of these experiences, and then 
it says he sees the extinguisher cap and by sudden action pressed down upon its head. He's trying at the very end of all of this, he's trying to stuff all that memory back away. That's the right. spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not God. hide the light, right. Right. which streamed forth from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. Okay, well, I'll, bring it, I'll bring it. He's drawing. The guy's about 24 years old when he does this, or 26. Wow. And it's just wonderful. And nobody's much talked about how wonderful his drawings are for, for the Carol. And this is because that's a light that is not, not any longer just uh, located in a particular spot. I mean, it is the whole essence of what the season and the birth of Christ can bring into the world forever. Uh, and it's there, We're just in a black and white woodcut. It's there. <laughs> it's That's awesome. And that hat, as I mentioned earlier, is something that was woven by you know, human hands to try to deface and put it away. Uh, it's interesting because the uh, uh, Fezziwig wears a, a Welch cap. And I was looking to see what a Welch cap was this morning. Well, the Welch uh, wool uh, industry was, was sort of in failing times. And so they in, in developed, try to develop new commercial products. And one was a tightly knit cap that covered all over the face and all over the back of the head. And at the bottom on the back, the reason it was called a Welch wig was that the, they, they had little curly kind of bits of cloth in the back to protect oh. the back of your neck in storms and so forth and so on. So it actually was something that was woven by human hands oh, that never occurred to me until just this moment. Thank you, Father Casey and Rebecca for the uh, image that the cap, the extinguisher cap is a different way of weaving something. Mm -hmm. and the Welch cap works as a part of keeping that spirit alive mm -hmm. and the extinguisher cap does it. And of course, what happens, the, you, you just pointed it out, right, that, that the curtains open for the ghost of Christmas uh, past. And uh, that, that's kind of like a show sort of opening and then you close the curtain down. So it's very theatrical too. But the curtains of the bed, oh, the only part of those curtains that open, it's not at his feet mm -hmm. and it's not at his back. It's where his eyes are. That's so right. The ghost pulls apart the curtain that makes him blind and mm -hmm. shines light in where it can be received. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. And I'll go ahead and jump in here. <clears throat> Deuteronomy, right? <laughs> uh, no, no, but seriously, it's De for Deuteronomy, right, there aren't 613 laws. There's only one law. And the one law, according to Deuteronomy, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's the only law. Once you do that, everything takes care of itself. For Deuteronomy, there aren't bazillion types of sins. There's only one sin for Deuteronomy. And it's forgetting. Hmm. Your eyes have seen all of this stuff. Don't forget, because once you forget, then that commandment is going to go out the window. And so for me, at least, it's so memory and remembering and, and imaging um, is so important. And it's, and it's, and it's indicative, even, even, right? And for me, at least, yet again, I've read this a bazillion times, at the mention of Alibaba, it was like, what in the heck is going on here? I had no idea this time finally reading it it's like scrooge himself it's like he's inside the little boy's head and he's able to see this and it is as real as the schoolmaster it is as real as fezziwig it is as real as dick it is as real as bell it is as real as all of those kids that the the alibaba and robin crusoe and the parrot are just as real um which is important because in fact what we are doing is reading a story. And I can tell you that Ebenezer, for me at least, is as real as Casey and as Rebecca and as Bob. Um, and that's where this power comes from, so. Okay, he's now called us all Scrooges. Do we want to have him repent? <laughs> uh, no, that, that's- really because... <laughs> But aren't we all a little yeah. Scrooge? But, but what Roy's bringing up, I think, is the fact that 
in the midst of all of this, because Dickens had loved the theater since a kid, mm. and he staged plays and he acted in plays and wrote plays. Um, but there is a theatrical dimension right. to this story, even right. in the way the scenes are presented, like slides and, and things, or you know, episodes. Um, you thought of the, the three act structure uh, in, in one instance, and the right. curtains pulling open. That's right, exactly. Very much uh, the way things happened. So uh, it's not a wonder that it got adapted That's right. so quickly. And, 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 and it's also, right, I mean, like I, like I pointed out at my favorite passage from the first stave, right, nothing wonderful can come from this unless you realize that Marley is dead. In fact, and it's in by the end of the by the end of the book. Again, spoiler alert. By the end of the book, it's 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 not really Scrooge's reclamation. It's not really Scrooge's redemption that's important. It's the reader's reclamation. It's the reader's redemption that's important. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 being able to read this book and just the power of literature itself is just it's just. The imagination is restored, mm. is, is resurrected, and the book, um, the Holy Gospel, mm. is also working in that same way. So right. as an Advent book, it's really asking for the same kind of response that, that our readings. Isn't that true, Father That's Casey? Beautiful. Rebecca? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Pay attention to those bed curtains too. They're going to show up again. <laughs> it's true. Bad way. I wonder, though, as I'm aware that we're drawing toward 11:15, and I wonder if if folks have questions. We we had hoped to reserve some time. If you do, um, use the Q and A uh, section to ask a question. And I've been trying to monitor the chat as well for those. Uh, but I'm I'm interested in hearing from others. Um, who have been reading or watching some of the dramatizations. Uh, what is this conversation sparking for you all? We'll give that a moment to roll through because it, it takes a while for people to ask their questions. It's been so much fun again. Again, it's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it is. Is it, is it a pipe dream that I think people might go back and read chapter two again and look at the theme of light and darkness? I volunteer. I'll do it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> just, just one more, just one more tiny thing talking about time, right? Because at the beginning, right, he can't see anything, right? It's totally dark. And the only way that he can measure time, the only way that he can measure reality is in fact through, through listening to the bells, right? So there's one bell, two bell, right? And I don't know how many bells are at the very beginning of the state, but he, he's listening for bells, bells, because bells give him a, 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 a way in which he can, he can latch on to what's real, which is interesting, because again, it's fiction. Dickens could have named her anything, but what he names, right, the fiance is bell, because oh. it's bell that gives him that, that grasp on reality. Um, so and the again, next it's, book he writes is called The Chimes, and oh, we'll do that. Yeah. That's right. That's great. So next year we'll do the chimes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I asked a question about the best edition to read. I went out and bought this one after you showed it last week. Yeah, uh, I got a used copy of it. This is um, the annotated Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens. Uh, it was, it was, it's a reprint. 1976, it says. Michael Patrick Hearn. Yeah. Avenal mm. Books, A V E N E L Books. Mm. I found it on the um, the big bookstore that begins with an A that we don't talk about around here. Uh, but it's got <laughs> the illustrations. Uh, <laughs> um, it's got the illustrations in it. There are a number of them. Nice. Uh, the nice thing about this one is that it is annotated, and so just like a study Bible. Um, mm. which can help you with the things that you don't understand. Like why on earth are we suddenly talking about Alibaba? Uh, right. you know, there's a little yeah. margin note at the side that will tell you a little bit about that. So that's been really enjoyable uh, for me this past week. Speaking of Alibaba, it struck me that here we have somebody who's poor and suddenly becomes rich. Mm. And right, so we have the whole theme of poor poverty and riches we have the whole theme of Robinson Crusoe, someone who's alone 
and yet has someone. And so we have, so just the, the tr and Orson and Valentine as well, you sort of have, you know, how you raise people that are separated, that don't know their past, that discover their past. And, and so just the, the, the choices that Dickens made in which stories the boy is excited about is actually formative for the theme as for the whole book, so. If Valentine and Orphan, Valentine, Love and Or and Ursus the Bear uh, in the, in the uh, yes or no game that they, that, that friends, <laughs> uh, friends play, the last, animal or creature that they're trying to identify is the bear, mm. is the orson. Mm. So Scrooge is perhaps not only Scrooge and Marley, but also the Valentine it's and beautiful. the bear. You know, I, again, it's, it's just so sweet. I have two- can't skip anything. I have, I have two notes that we haven't gotten to yet that I just feel like are, are worth noting. When the spirit comes, Scrooge asks him what his business is, harking back to talking about business last week. And the response is your welfare, right? Which is such a great um, play on words, right? Because Scrooge mm -hmm. is the last one to be interested in sharing welfare with others. And yet, right. and, and yet if, if, if it's his welfare, then a good night's sleep would have helped more. And so, the, so he has to come back and he says, your reclamation. Which yes. is another economic term. Yes. You know, yes. So, yeah. So. And fair can either be uh, cost or a way of going. Yes. So we're back to travel right. and money. It's money. That's exactly. And, and yep. you start unpacking every word of Dickens. And he had a little Latin uh, from his mother and also afterwards at Wellington House Academy. So I'm never reluctant to go back and look at the Latin derivation of words to see if it could possibly have all that. Because the, the moment any of us use language, we're using 2,000 years of archive. Right. Yeah. And we can't help That's it. Beautiful. It's, it's the words we're given are our inheritance, not something we create. Uh, we do have well, a the question. Was the word. <laughs> We have a question in the chat that maybe we could address very briefly. It oh, seems good. confusing that the story happens over three or four nights, or is it it's one night, night yeah. that time in the story <sighs> seems completely messed up? He goes to bed on Christmas Eve, and of course we know we end the story on Christmas Day, and yet there are three successive nights of visit. Can you That's right. Talk about that a little bit, Bob. Or can we come back to that? Because I'm aware of the time. Sure. And that might be a, great, a great lead off. Uh, for I think, I think it has to do with memory. So and how memory is neither past nor uh, me memory messes up your time. But anyway, that's but what I think. It let's is. do come back and maybe start off class next week with just a short sure. discussion of of time sure. and how it works in the story. Because I think I think it's a, it's an excellent question, Angelo, and um, and in a good that probably a lot of us are wondering. Yeah. So, Father Casey, did you say you wanted to say something now? No, no. I think that's it. I think that um, we've covered a tremendous amount of terrain. I, I'm aware that we have outdoor church for those. <laughs> Very hearty souls who are going to come out on a damp, cool morning and be with us. Um, but uh, we need to go get ready for that. Another absolutely wonderful and delightful conversation. I cannot already wait for next week as we um, uh, reach the ghost of Christmas present with all of its own wonderful and very different experiences. Um, and uh, you know, each stave is very unique. And so um, if you haven't already, do pick up a copy, find it online. You can read it for free online if you want to and join us in, um, in really looking closely at this story because there's just a, a wealth of riches um, uh, for us to, um, to enjoy and experience. And in fact, uh, this experience is another experience of time repeating, recycling every week. So <laughs> the answer to your question may be you're living you're That's living right. for four nights in one right now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, friends. Well, we'll uh, regather next week, 1015, and we'll see you then and pick up in uh, stave three, the ghost of Christmas present. All right. Bless you all, friends. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.
拜。